Hello, and you're very welcome to the third of our series of Advent Reflections. My name is Father Damien Polly. I'm a Dominican, and I welcome you here to our beautiful St. Mary's Church in Pope's Quay in Cork City in Ireland. Today, I'd like to reflect on the Gospel for the third Sunday of Advent, Gaudete Sunday. But before we do, let us listen to the Word of God proclaimed in the Gospel for this Sunday. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. When all the people asked John, what must we do? He answered, if anyone has two tunics, he must share with the man who has none. And the one with something to eat must do the same. There were tax collectors, two who came for baptism, and these said to him, Master, what must we do? He said to them, Exact no more than your rate. Some soldiers asked him in their turn, What about us? What must we do? He said to them, No intimidation, no extortion. Be content with your pay. A feeling of expectancy had grown among the people who were beginning to think that John might be the Christ. So John declared before them all, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming, someone who is more powerful than I am and I am not fit to undo the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn in a fire that will never go out. As well as this, there were many other things he said to exhort the people and to announce the good news to them. The Gospel of the Lord. One of the most universal desires of the human condition is to be happy. Happiness, as we know, is something that can fluctuate from day to day, depending on our emotions or the circumstances of our lives. Joy, on the other hand, is something quite different. And for a Christian, it's possible to live with a deep and lasting joy, even in the moments of difficulty, or trial in our lives. Because joy is a fruit of the love of God in our lives. It comes from knowing that we are loved by God, that we are saved by him, and from being in a relationship with him. And it is this joy which comes from God that I would like to speak to you about on this Gaudete Sunday. Gaudete being the Latin word for rejoice. In our gospel today, we're introduced to the great figure of John the Baptist. John, who was to prepare a way for the Lord, to prepare for the mission of Jesus. And John the Baptist is one who experienced the joy of God at an early point, a very early point in his life. As we read in the Gospel of Luke, when Mary, carrying Jesus in her womb, visited her cousin Elizabeth, and the greeting reached Elizabeth's ears, John leapt for joy in her womb. Being in the presence of Jesus, his Saviour, he recognised it and he was filled with joy, as was Elizabeth. Mary, too, in this exchange, in this meeting with her cousin Elizabeth, was also filled with joy. And in her great prayer of praise, the Magnificat, she praises God and blesses him and she says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. Mary too is filled with the joy of the Lord. And once again, when the angel appears to the shepherds, the message is one of joy. The angel says, I bring you news of great joy for to you a savior is born today. In these three meetings, in these three exchanges, the one common factor is that the joy is as a result of the Saviour being close. 
the Savior coming close to John the Baptist in Mary's womb, the Savior dwelling in Mary's womb and filling her with the joy that only he can give. And then the angel being the, the announcer, the messenger of this good news that the Savior has come amongst us. And this is a joy for the whole world. Joy comes from being close to God. And that's what I'd like to focus on today in our reflection. In Ireland, we have a very important connection with John the Baptist. At our national shrine in Knock, where an apparition took place, it happened at the back wall of a church dedicated to St. John the Baptist. The church was dedicated in 1828, and the apparition happened in 1879. And again, this apparition came after a great time of trial and suffering in Ireland after the famine, which devastated Ireland in the 1840s. But in this apparition, many of you I'm sure are familiar, have seen images of this apparition. It's a very beautiful apparition and completely silent and very, very unique. But in the middle of this apparition, we have the Lamb of God situated on the altar with the angels overhead adoring. And we have Joseph, and Mary and John the Evangelist standing to the side in silent prayer. John, as we know, is the one who points to Jesus, who points others to Jesus. And this was his mission, his going before the Lord, pointing to them and saying, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So it's very fitting that the church of St. John the Baptist should be chosen by heaven as, this, as the place where this apparition takes place. And the Lamb of God is made visible to us in this stunning appar apparition. This apparition, as I said, happened after a time of great devastation and famine in Ireland where there was immense physical hunger. But the people of Ireland were very faithful to their faith. Indeed, they suffered hugely down through the centuries, persecution, going out to distant areas to try and celebrate the Mass in secret at the Mass Rocks and risking everything, including capture and death, imprisonment for their faith. But now in this country, we have a different type of hunger. We don't experience the same physical hunger that our ancestors experienced through that terrible famine. But I would suggest that there is an even more serious hunger that we are facing in this country today and that is a spiritual hunger. Unfortunately, and Ireland is not unique at this point, that many, many people have left the faith, the faith that our ancestors died for, that they suffered so much for. They just don't come to Mass anymore or they think it's irrelevant in their lives. And this spir spiritual hunger is spreading as people step away from God and they step away from the commandments of God. Society, unfortunately, is starting to glorify what is sinful and it thinks it leads to freedom and joy but unfortunately it doesn't and this is the great tragedy because it can't lead to joy because only joy comes from God God is the source of our joy as we spoke about earlier on being close to God the joy that comes from being in his presence and being in relationship with him if we decide to step away from God to abandon God that God is no longer relevant to us. This only leads to sorrow and pain. And this is why the church's mission is always to proclaim the good news, to reach out and bring the message of joy that John the Baptist began as a precursor to the Lord and the Lord continues to preach today through his church. In Ireland, those Catholics here who love their faith and are faithful to the church are still reeling after three very serious referendum results that we've had in the past couple of years. The first one was introducing same-sex marriage and making it legal here. The second one was introducing and legalizing abortion. And the third we've just had, which removed a blasphemy clause from the constitution. These referendums are showing a changing face in Ireland today. And the results of these referendums have been celebrated. It was very heartbreaking for me and even disturbing to see the rejoicing and the celebrating that took place, particularly after the abortion referendum was 
passed by the people. There was great celebrating and joy at such a tragic result. But this is where we stand. And of course, Ireland is not unique in this situation. And when we look around society and the way things are going, it might lead us to consider being depressed. What is the hope for the future? How are things going to change? But of course, we can't look that way because if we do, we deny the Christian virtue of hope. Even though we're only in the season of Advent now, we must remember that we are an Easter people and hallelujah is our song. Good Friday, the darkness and evil of Good Friday is not the end of the story. We know that the light and love of Easter Sunday, the resurrection, is the true end to the story and indeed the beginning. So when we look around and we see darkness seeming to increase in the world, we must remember that it only takes a small glimmer of light to dispel any darkness. And Jesus is the one who came into the world as the light of the world. And he continues to shine his light in the world through the church and through you and me who remain faithful to him and who strive to be his disciples, putting into practice those great virtues of faith and hope and love in our day-to-day -day lives. So we should always cling to that virtue of hope and remember that the victory has been won. The cross and the resurrection is the victory that has defeated evil, but there are still battles that have to be fought. So join us in part two as we explore what it means to fight those battles in our day-to-day -day lives. Welcome back to the second part of our third episode of our Advent series of reflections on this Gaudete Sunday. My name is Father Damien Polly, a Dominican, and I welcome you back to St. Mary's Dominican Church here in Cork City in Ireland. Before the break, we were speaking about the gift of joy, the deep joy that comes from knowing that we are loved by God, that we are saved by him, and from being in relationship with him. Our joy is also rooted in the victory that Jesus has won for us on the cross and the resurrection, the new life that he offers us. God has won the war with evil, but as I said before the break, there are still battles that have to be fought. And the main battle lines are drawn, not out there somewhere, but right here in our souls. This is the battleground in which the spiritual realm is fighting because it's fighting for us. Jesus wants us to fight with him, but the other side is always very strong and trying to deceive us and trying to lead us in the wrong way. John the Baptist is speaking to this situation today in the gospel when people come to him and they journey out into the wilderness. They recognize his holiness and his call to repentance and they ask, what must we do to be saved? And John's answer is to be fair and just, not to extort money. But he also is saying to them to turn away from sin. But many people today are not asking this question that was asked of John, what do we need to do to be saved? because the whole notion of salvation is not even on their radar because sin has been dismissed. And if sin is not a live reality in our world, there's no need for a savior, no need for someone to come and save us. What's sacred today is freedom, our perceived notion of freedom, a freedom to choose. And this is what's now held up as being sacrosanct, the freedom to choose to do what we want to do or to be who we want to be, not conditioned necessarily by rules, or if they are, they're personal ones made by ourselves, because there is such a thing as personal morality. The old notion of an objective moral truth is something antiquated getting in the way of our perceived notion of freedom that holds us back. And yet, Jesus is the one who says to us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So in answer to the question, what must we do to be saved? What does John ultimately do? Yes, he speaks to them in the gospel today, but finally he points. He points to Jesus and says those beautiful words, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. If people want to know what they have to do to be saved, John points them to the Savior, the only one who can indeed save us. John wants to bring people to God, not to himself 
John never put the focus on himself. He points to the Savior. And when Jesus' mission begins, he says of himself, I must decrease and he must increase. John knows that the, our joy is to be found in being close to God, as he experienced that from the very earliest moments of his life in his mother's womb. Only God can fulfill the deepest longings of our hearts. And this is what the great Saint Augustine discovered himself. Caught up in the pleasures of the world at an early age, he realized that he was never satisfied. It did not bring him the joy that the world promised him. And he has this famous line where he says, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Augustine had to discover for himself, he had to go on a journey to realize that our true fulfillment is only to be found in God. The joy that we all seek, that we desire, that abiding and deep joy comes from God. So I would say that as St. Augustine says, our hearts are restless until they rest in God. I would also say that our hearts are joyless until they find their true joy in God. And John the Baptist, in the model of John the Baptist and Jesus, both of them began their missions with the message of repentance and turning back to the good news. Our society, the hope for our societies of change can only come about when people realize this for themselves, just like St. Augustine had to do, that we come back and we turn back to God. This is the message of John the Baptist and this is the message of Jesus. There is no way in which we can find, no other way in which we can find that true joy and peace that the Lord wants us to have, except to turn away from sin, which robs us of our joy, and turn back to God, the God of love, who will fill us again with his love and joy. Saint Augustine discovered for himself the joy that comes from following and believing in the good news that Jesus preached, and it led that to that profound repentance and change of his life. Jesus knows how sick sin makes us. So he is the one who comes to us as our divine physician, as our healer. But he doesn't just come as our healer, he also comes as the cure. He is the only one who can forgive us. He is the only one who can lead us out of the unhappiness that we find ourselves in when we get caught up in sin and set us again on the path that leads to true happiness, to joy. Again, John the Baptist understood this. That's why he points to Jesus and says, go to him, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And this Advent season is a beautiful time to prepare our hearts to enter into that great gift of the sacrament of confession, to prepare a crib in our heart, a wonderful welcome place for Jesus to reside this Christmas. And if we haven't been to confession maybe for months, even years, to take this opportunity to not be afraid there is nothing to be afraid of going to confession to Jesus to experience God's love and mercy through his priest in the sacrament. It is a wonderful joy and a wonderful gift that God has given us that he wants us to avail of. And it's a way in which we receive the grace that God wants to give us. The Greek word for joy is kara, and the Greek word for grace is charis. So we can see that kara is coming from charis. Joy is coming from grace. Grace, the more we have in our lives, the more joyful we will be. And grace is a sharing in the divine life of God. That's why when Mary went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, she was so full of joy. She was rejoicing because, as we say in our beautiful prayer to her, Hail Mary, full of grace. She was full of the grace of God that brings the immense and abundant joy that God wants us to have, that fullness of life that he has created each of us for. Confession, obviously, is a wonderful way in which we prepare ourselves, not just for Christmas, but to prepare ourselves to re receive the ultimate and the most beautiful gift that God can ever give us and has given us, and that is the Eucharist, received every time we go to Mass. So again, if it has been a while since you've been to confession, to go and avail yourself of the beauty of this. Again, preparing that crib, that wonderful dwelling place for God so that he can truly fill us with his love and his joy and his peace at this Christmas time. Jesus is the great healer of our souls who heals us in the sacrament of confession when he forgives us, but most beautifully when he gives himself to us in the gift of the Eucharist, when he becomes a holy communion with us. Pope Francis has said that the Eucharist is not a prize for the perfect, but a powerful medicine and nourishment for the weak. The Eucharist is a foretaste of the Holy Communion that God wants us to have with him in heaven. Jesus himself said to us, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Our joy will never be truly complete in this life. This is what heaven is for. 
God wanting us to be in his presence for all eternity, in communion with him and with the saints. Advent is a great time of expectation, of looking forward, of looking forward to the birth of our Saviour at Christmas, but also to his second coming, to that reality, to that meeting that we will have with him at the end of our lives. John the Baptist was focused on eternal and not material things. And in the course of this Advent season, with the great busyness that goes on with it, with the gift buying and the care for others, I just pray that our focus may not just be on material things, that we don't forget the eternal reality that this season is pointing us to. The knock vision that we spoke about earlier on, the apparition, is a vision of heaven uniting itself with earth. But it's also a vision of the mass, the Lamb of God on the altar, the saints adoring and the angels worshipping overhead. And this reality happens for us at every single mass that we go to. This hidden reality of heaven uniting itself with earth, of Jesus coming down to us in the most holy Eucharist. Angels don't even have this great privilege of receiving Jesus in the Eucharist. And the great Saint Maximilian Kolbe once said that if angels could be jealous, they would be jealous of us for one thing, Holy Communion, the immense gift that we have before us at every single Mass. So how do we receive and experience this deep joy that the Lord wants us to have? Well, as I said at the beginning, very simply by remaining close to the Lord. And there's no closer that we can come to the Lord than in the Eucharist, that total gift of himself to us. But I want to leave you with a little anacronym, a way of trying to live out this joy and experience it in our lives by living joy, J-O-Y, simply standing for Jesus, others, you. By putting Jesus first, remaining close to him, we receive the joy that comes from the Lord, and then that's the joy that we can share with others as we serve them, as we strive to love one another as Christ has loved us. This is the call of the Christian, to serve others as Christ has served us. And then, in giving, we receive by helping others, by being in relationship with others, all flowing from our relationship with God. That joy comes, the joy of not just being focused in on ourselves, but of giving of ourselves in love, as Jesus did for us. Joy is infectious. When other people see the joy in us, they will want to know what is the source of our joy. And then that will be an opportunity for us to evangelize, for us to share what our joy is about and who is the source of our joy. We, like John the Baptist, will then start to point others to Jesus, pointing them to receive the joy that we are experiencing in our lives. Saint Mother Teresa said that joy is a net of love by which we catch souls. So from John the Baptist and Mary, we can see that the joy is to be found in being close to the Lord. As we look forward to Christmas, we have every reason to leap for joy with John the Baptist and to rejoice with Mary because our God has loved us enough to become one of us. He has loved us enough to die for us and he has loved us enough to remain with us in the Eucharist and give the complete gift of himself to us. As you journey through this wonderful and grace-filled season of Advent, may Jesus truly be the source of your joy by putting him first in your life, and then others, and then you will receive the true blessings of God, one of which is his deep and abiding joy. I would just like to sincerely thank you for joining us today and I hope these reflections will, in some small way, help you prepare for this beautiful season of Christmas. On behalf of the Dominican community here in St. Mary's, and myself, Father Damien, I thank you for joining us for this episode. And please do visit us if you are in Cork anytime. We would be delighted to see you. Please also join us next week for our final episode in this Advent series of Reflections with Father Patrick McCarthy. May God bless you. <laughs>